To me, just like watching that. his film, he seems more of a back. Just the dead. presence he's got in that pocket, the way he throws the football, rust days, man, all the scrutiny that line was under. This Monday night's big. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Hawk Zone Rundown with Armac and B Rice. Today on the show, uh, we have guests Bill and Keith from the Seahawks Playbook podcast. And uh, we're going to dive into stuff that's going on with Gino, the John Schneider recent uh presser what what these guys kind of think of uh of you know how they're going about with sort of not really being direct and uh, kind of get their thoughts on that. We're in the middle of the combine and uh we're going to ask the guys what uh who they like that uh so far in the combine that uh you know might fit well in a Seahawks uniform. And just talk about the offense, you know, how how do they envision this offense kind of looking a little different than last year? With Grubb in here, you know, is guys like DK going to be the focal point? And you know what? Get their opinions on, you know, who uh, might be some free agent uh, additions in the offseason here. And uh, before we get into that, B. Rice, what's uh, what's happening, man? Not much, man. Just, you know, doing my re- draft research and such. And, you know, just kind of trying to figure out what what's going on right now with the, you know, the combine and the fact uh that the uh, linebackers just, man, I got worried watching them. I watched them in the combine and they don't look like a good group, dude. It's not looking good. I think we have to spend some money for agency. We weren't expecting to spend. You know, there's still some options available. Obviously, you know, we could still resign Brooks. We could still resign Bobby. So, you know, we, that's the thing too. And obviously the, uh, the Patrick queen uh, rumors flying around. So like you said, it could be a, could be some money being spent and uh, you know what? That's uh that's that might not be a bad thing anyway. So, um, but, uh, you know, other than that, man, uh, I can't wait to uh, dive into things with Bill and Keith from the Seahawks playbook. But before we get to that, guys, just some quick housekeeping, uh, you know, make sure if you like what you hear and make sure you, uh, you know, you subscribe to the channel, uh, subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, hit the notification button. And you know what? Throw some comments in at us, man, because we love interacting with you guys. Uh, and just kind of getting your thoughts of what you think of, you know, just uh, myself and, and B Rice's opinion on on what's happening out there. So, uh, you know, on the other side, we're going to get into it with Bill and Keith from the Seahawks playbook right after this. All right. Hey, guys, welcome back to the show here. Today joining us is Bill and Keith from the Seahawks Playbook podcast. And uh, guys, thanks for coming on the show and uh, talking Hawks with us tonight. Hey, Ryan. Hey, thanks for having us. It's uh, great to be here. We always love to talk Seahawks football, even the offseason. We were just talking before we push record. And uh, I can speak with Keith, for Keith, too. This is our favorite time of the year, really, to kind of uh, be around Seahawks football after the season. Uh, you you start uh, talking about uh, coaching changes. You start talking about players and contracts and cap space, and then you get into uh, evaluating players at the Senior Bowl and the Combine, and you lead up to the draft. It's it's fun. Yeah, yeah, no, we it, freak, freaking love this time of year. Absolutely. Yeah, no, <laughs> we do too. It's just it's just one of those things, like you said. It's Senior Bowl. It's it's uh, we're combines here already. Then you get the draft. Then it's you know mini camp. Can it just it's just next thing you know we're uh, we're getting ready for Sunday. So it's it's uh, and especially right now, right? Obviously, you guys know just all the crazy stuff that's happened. Um, so obviously, some of the latest stuff is uh, you know kind of surrounding Geno Smith and and with John and Mike McDonald coming out and kind of not really giving those direct answers. Or you, they they think they are, but you're trying to read into it a little more. Um, so kind of what, especially with the latest with, with John, those based on what you've heard, um, where do you see Geno Smith when camp starts? Do you see him on this team and do you see him starting, uh, you know, when the season kicks off here? Well, I'll, I'll start. I mean, Keith and I have been talking about this on our show and I've kind of been advocating for this since, you know, the day after the season ended, 
is that I've always felt like Gino's probably going to come back. They're probably figure out a way to rework his contract and, and uh, either extend him or convert, you know, some, some dollars. And, and that's what they ended up doing. And then you're right. They were kind of non-committal about um, Gino on the roster in this last uh, week and a half or so. I think um, McDonald was on uh, TV uh, giving a little interview and said, well, I, I can't really answer that right now about whether Gino is going to be the starter this year or what they're going to do with the quarterback position. And then you mentioned um, Schneider this week uh, at the Combine giving a uh, press conference and so forth and just kind of being, you know, he's a, our starter until he's not. Well, what does that mean? And then just today or yesterday came out and said, you know, a report came out from uh, Schultz that said that uh, Gino's in fact going to going to be on the roster. Now he didn't say he's going to start, but that's kind of the implication, you know. And you and you alluded to, is it a good idea for Gino to start next year? I think it is. And and the reason I say that is, you know, you said there's people that uh, buy into Gino and people that have a hard time with him. And I'm probably more in the camp of I like what Gino does for the team. You know, he's a good influence on the roster. He's a good leader. All that kind of stuff. And when you take a look at the advanced stats and so forth. He's, you know, top 12, top 15 quarterback, probably good enough to get you, you know, deep into the playoffs, depending on how your roster looks around him. And I think with Mike McDonald, the new coaching staff, for me, I think Gino probably gives you the best chance to start this year. You go look at the free agency in the quarterback market. It's not going to be great. Never usually is. Trade market is always squirrely. You're going to give up compensation there. You might as well give up compensation to move up in the draft if you like a quarterback, and they could definitely do that. It's going to be really expensive. I think what happened at, at the Combine is John meets with a whole bunch of executives. They start talking shop. There's really not a market developing for Gino out there, so he kind of battens down that hatch. I don't know exactly who leaked that information, but there's always somebody that's benefiting from whatever information is out there. So. I don't know how Keith feels. I, Keith's a little less bullish on Gino than I am, mm. but I still think it makes most most sense. Yeah. So like Gino, um, as a the quarterback, as a leader, as a player, I, I value him less than Bill does. Uh, I think that he's okay. And I don't think you win Super Bowls with okay. And I also think that you don't put yourself in position to draft a good quarterback when you're okay. Um, so they need to roll the dice and, um, that roll of the dice will either work and they'll be great or it won't. And they'll be able to draft a replacement. Um, that's kind of my thought. I also thought that $30 million for a, um, you know, a bridge player was excessive. Um, even if it, you know, that, okay, that matches his pro, uh, production compared to the quarterback market. Fine. But it's still $30 million of cap space for a bridge. And so that that's kind of been my thought. At the same time, I knew he was going to be around. Like, as much as I could be like, I don't think they should be, that doesn't mean he's not going to be. And the, I had a little bit of a different take on that, that, um, that report that came out. I thought it was more of a, um, after both the coach and GM have been like, yeah, maybe, maybe not, um, about Gino, that Gino and his agent called and were like, what the hell? And that yeah. got leaked out, um, as a, let's you know calm calm gino down i don't think it had anything to do with the trade market or anything like that because honestly there was never going to be one even if people thought there would be um and i i think it was more just like let's you know not have uh gino all pissed off all off season yeah no uh, i kind of the way i've looked at this whole thing the way this has transpired and, and the way that it sits now after that last report it kind of reminds me when Matt Flynn was here. We paid all that money to Matt Flynn in 2012. We hedged against the draft. They ended up drafting Russell, and they had T-Jack still on the roster at that point as well. And you were basically taking your shot. If our rookie quarterback pans out, great. And they sat Flynn that entire year. Um, but you're not going to take that dead cap hit of $27 million to trade or cut Geno. Like, it just financially doesn't make much sense. But I'm kind of with you, Keith, like, they need to take their shot eventually and, and draft a quarterback and start rolling the dice because the team's actually relatively young. It's not like you've got this older team that you're going to have to completely rebuild. You've got a lot of the young pieces kind of in place, younger players. 
you might as well start taking your shot and kind of follow the Green Bay model, which was if you look at when Green Bay was there, they drafted like Mark Brunel, Aaron Brooks, Matt Hasselbeck, Doug Peterson. Like they kept drafting guys constantly and then they trade them off. They didn't work. And the guys, you know, we got Matt Hasselbeck and he was a great starter for us for years, but we got to start taking our shot. And even John's comment about we've only drafted two quarterbacks in 14 years. You can tell it's bugging him that he hasn't been more successful in that. And like, Oh, we're going to wait. Like, I'd honestly be okay if they moved up. Like we've given away first round picks for Jimmy Graham and Jamal Adams and Percy Harvin. Like if you can move up and get a Jaden Daniels or a Drake May or one of these guys, and it's a possibility that we have a franchise quarterback for 10 years, I'm okay burning an extra first round pick when I know I've got so much young talent still on this roster. I can fill out gaps with, third, fourth rounds in free agency if I got an established young quarterback on a rookie deal for five years that could take over my job. And I'm with you too, Bill. Gino can start next year, but at least let's get somebody in there that's better than Drew Locke or gives us more potential than Drew Locke. I agree with you, Bryce. You know, last year we had an opportunity cost sitting at five overall. And but you know if if uh Schneider only really liked Stroud and he just wasn't gonna be available and it was too expensive to go to, to one yeah. overall then that's just the way that it, it fell out. Um, and then obviously he passed on a, a couple other quarterbacks we all thought may have been in play. And so obviously it was either Stroud or bust, I think. And then uh, this year we're sitting at 16. It We're in that really kind of iffy yeah. zone as a franchise where you're going to be middling for a while if you don't take some shots or if you get really lucky uh, that that's great. Now the trade market's always going to be bad because nobody's going to trade you a franchise quarterback probably. Yeah. And then, um, so you've got to move up, you know, you do. And if he really likes one of these top three quarterbacks and they kind of fall a little bit into the eight, 10 range, I could see them moving. I really could. And it's going to cost you probably two first to do that. But, um, like you said, if, if they've fallen in love, they've done their due diligence. That's their guy. Go get them. Yeah, um, yeah, mid middling for us is Bryce and I's worst, you know, nightmare sort of thing. Like, it's everybody. It, it is, and and you look at some teams that have done it for a long time, and it just it scares you, right? So, and and you look at you know two years in a row, nine and eight, and Gino's here, and and Gino's here again, and and that's why you know we were obviously you know pro moving on from Pete, even though you know everybody loved what he did here, but <clears throat> because you just knew that it was going to be the same thing again. You're going to run that back and you're just going to be nine and eight. Um, so what do you guys think though? They, so you think if you don't move up with, and get one of these top three guys, is there anybody else that could be a day two quarterback that, you know, like I, I know, like you're saying, you kind of, you get a little lucky, like the Russ situation when they, when they got him where they got him. But is there anyone in this draft at that position that you think, okay, you know what day two guy, can you know Gino can still be the guy for the year and this guy can sort of sit he can learn learn the position a little more kind of get used to the NFL and the system is there anybody that you like there that say okay you know what this guy can can push and, and maybe be that next guy see there's a couple guys um one would be Bo Nix out of Oregon the other one would be Michael Penix out of Washington both guys are older prospects um and you know we don't we know the track record for older older um draft picks yeah. but um, so they'll drop a little bit. Penix cat has the, um, knee issue. Um, Nick's has some question marks on whether he can, he's got that cannon, which he doesn't, but he's really accurate. So it doesn't matter. Um, and so both those guys are probably going to drop a little bit. Uh, the problem with them is the, that their age it's their, they're older. So if you, uh, take them in, in the second round and then have them sit for a year, they may be 27 before they first get their first start. And that's, kind of scary, right? Because then you want guys that um, are younger when, you know, because that's, they just have more development and more development time and, and more, a higher ceiling. But at the same time, go watch their tape. Both those guys are impressive, impressive players. So um, yeah, there's a good chance either one of them could be in play for Seattle. I would add two names too, uh, JJ McCarthy. I think, you, you know, his guys doesn't have quite the arm. A um, little bit uh, slighter prospect. He's still 6'3". He's got the height. He could probably put on a little bit of weight, but he's really accurate. Um, and he's 
they're talking about him moving moving up a little bit. You know, he started out. You, know, you take a look at mock drafts, big boards. Uh, in January, he's in the the thirties, late thirties, forties, and now he's kind of creeping into the first round. Mm-hmm. That's a, kind of a have, name to watch. You may have if you're Seattle, you may have to move up to get him. Mm. And then Spencer Rattler is the other guy. I think oh. you know. Yeah, um, I know that Keith isn't uh, impressed with his tape, but he's got some tools there. He's toolsy and he would require some development time and there the four lies Geno Smith on the roster. So you've got a year with Spencer Rattler, maybe something like that. You take a shot at the, you know, in the third round with one of your third round picks or you move up slightly to get, go get him if if you believe that he's a guy that you could develop. Um and that's really about it as far as now I, there, there could be a, a Brock Purdy out there somewhere, right? Uh-huh. But we saw what Michael Pratt did, what what Joe Milton did in, in the Senior Bowl. It was not pretty, uh, but they had good tape overall. You know, as far as arm strength, um, mobility, uh, bigger bigger guy than Joe Milton. So I mean, there could be a team out there that's kind of looking for that pocket passer. I don't think Seattle's going to be that, um, based on the way that Grubb probably wants to run this offense. But JJ McCarthy might be a guy. Um, that would fit what Grubb likes to do if he can't get a hold of um, Penix. Real, yeah. real, real quick, just to follow real quick. So that being said, everything said, do they 100% take a QB in this draft? Do you see it no matter what? I do. Um, and that a lot of that's coming from uh, Schneider's comments that – you can tell like two quarterbacks in 14 years and one of them was a seventh round pick. Like that bugs him. Uh, he comes from the, the Ron Wolf tree. He's going to get a guy. Um, I'm not so sure. Is, does that mean he's going to get a guy that's going to be one of these guys that we're talking about the top six or seven? What? Not necessarily. He may take a guy in the sixth round, but he's going to draft a quarterback. Right. We've only got seven picks. We're not, we're, we don't have a second round pick. We don't have the ammunition. So if you take a look at the the way the first round is constructed, there's a chance that we could get a kind of a blue chippy player at 16, depending on how the draft falls. You almost got to stick and pick if you do. Mm. Um, if you are going to move back, though, to accumulate some draft capital, especially trying to get back into the second round, Schneider's not going to go from 16 to 75 or whatever our, our pick is, 76. That's 60 spots that he's got to sit there and wait. No way. So he's going to figure out a way to, to move up. The one way you can do it is move back out of the first round, you know, into the twenties somewhere and, or combine the, the two thirds and maybe a future or a player or something to kind of move, move back up um, into the second round to, to drop the player. Now, as far as the, the quarterback question, that's where it gets dicey for me because with that limited draft capital in the, in the first 100 picks, they, the draft just might not fall in that way. I mean, it, and they've talked about wanting to, to look at quarterbacks in future or, or past drafts and just not have it work out. That same thing could happen in this one because once you get past that Spencer Radler kind of level and you're dropping into the third tier, fourth tier, um, they may have other priorities. Well, I, I have a feel like uh, when I came away from Schneider's press conference, I thought that of that as um, very much like, that was a Pete Carroll thing where Pete Carroll was like, no, we need to, we need, we need to go get more defensive players or we need to, we need, you know, certain things. And so uh, Schneider just never went and got that quarterback because he knew that, that Pete knew that player wasn't going to play. Right. Cause they have got Russ. And now I, I just, mm-hmm. I just get a deal, different feeling. And um, yeah, it's like, you know, five minutes of, of Schneider talking and about many things, but I, I just think that they, I think they're going to get a quarterback. Now, I think they'll be, you know, they've got this two third round picks. Maybe they move back on, on one of them, move back into the the top of the fourth with one of them and, you know, get a bunch of picks, you know, rounds five, six, seven. Um, and that's where they go get a quarterback. But I do see them, uh, them getting one in this just because they'd like to have young uh, quarterbacks around. Yeah, no, I, I, I kind of agree. Like, I, I think, I agree with Bill. I think what you got to do in some respects is if you got to find a way to get a second round pick because you did give it up for Leonard Williams, which still to this day still drives me nuts because I'm getting Sheldon Richardson PTSD all over again if they don't resign him. Um, but it's one of those situations for me where I look at it and I go, 
like you said, Keith, Bo Nix and Michael Penix both are older prospects. Michael Penix's draft history or uh, medical history definitely is something that's going to be concerned. You might be able to move back six spots or seven or go to the later 20s, maybe even early 30s in the first round, get a second round pick possibly with that move and draft um, still a decent player and then get Michael Penix in the second round. And I look at Penix and I kind of, out of all the older questionable prospects at the quarterback position, at least with Ryan Grubb here, he's not going to have as much of a steep learning curve to playing as like, say a Spencer Rattler or a Joe Milton. Like he, he knows the terminology of Ryan Grubb's system, which I'm sure Grubb's going to pull a lot of it from his Washington days across. I think it would make an easier transition where he could compete to play right away if he gets a handle of it, kind of like Russ did. That's the only quarterback I see where if we wait, he could possibly still produce quite well. And from all intents and purposes, everything that I've been seeing, everyone says he's doing phenomenal at the combine with the interviews and he did the same thing at Senior Bowl. I like J.J. McCarthy because he's young. He's 21. I get him. I've got, like you said, Keith, you get some of these older guys, you're 27, 28 before they're starting. You get J.J., he's 25 when his, you know, contract comes up. I like Rattler's toolsiness. I've been a guy that's kind of been interested in Rattler, but the one most polarizing guy to me in this draft is Joe Milton, because if you look at his stats and you look at him as a player, he's almost Anthony Richardson 2.0. He's not the runner that Anthony Richardson is. He doesn't have that same athleticism, but their stats are so similar that it's amazing that one year later, the guy that everyone said was this freak is going to be possibly a fifth, sixth round possible quarterback in Joe Milton and last year, a guy with a similar skill set was picked fifth with, as actually in some respects, fewer starts than Joe Milton has. Yeah, well, if uh, on our show, you would have heard me say that, um, you know, Anthony Richardson should have been valued in the third, fourth, fifth round um, because playing quarterback is not about athleticism. No, nope. it's about between the ears. And uh, there's nothing on his tape from Florida that suggested that he was going to be an NFL quarterback um, right away. And so for Andy to take him fourth overall and expect him to be their week one starter, I thought was absolutely crazy. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. yeah no, you know, when Milton, uh, sorry, Milton is, uh, you know, he's got a great arm, good, good measurables, all that stuff. He's really horrible in his accuracy, both short oh, and yeah. long especially long, like he's one of the worst long ball throwers in this class. And um, especially in this offense and even our, our last offense, they're going to want to take shots. You know, yeah. that's, that's the whole thing about the NFL is you're, you're setting your defenses up yeah, so that the, you know, you've got a, a, an extra defensive back coming up and then you take your shot. And if he can't get that ball out, I don't, I don't know. I, I think he's a developmental project. That's probably a career backup. Yeah, hey, um, sort of segue into the offense right now. Obviously, we got a, a brand new coordinator, Ryan Grubb. And um, so obviously we're gonna have a, a whole new look. How do you how do you guys think the offense is gonna be different from previous years? And does because I'm a huge DK Metcalf advocate. Bryce and I love the guy. We think he could be a, I, mean, I think he could be a top five guy in this league. How how does how does he get unleashed? How does how does Grub use him, and does he become sort of more of a focal point? Um, you know, you talk about taking shots. Seemed like kind of one of his only routes. They like kind of throwing him. Uh, you know, they sort of mixed in the the slant routes and all that stuff. And you saw what what he can do. Um, so, what what are you guys' thoughts overall with with how this offense could look different and and with DK? Man, that's a it's a tough question because. You're, ta you're talking about a college offense and moving it over. But then also, if you look at Grubb and the, and the offense that he's run, um, both at Washington, under DeBoer at San Diego State, and you know earlier in his career, um, it doesn't look the same in all those places. And you know, I did some reading and, and talking to some other coach – or not talking, reading what other people talk to other, other uh, coaches that coaches with them. And it, basically, it's a he builds an offense to the talent he's got. Um, this isn't a, I've got a system and I go run this, this thing. Um, and if you, so if you're doing that and you look at Seattle, man, that's DK Metcalf, right? That's, that's your first thing. You go, what, what does Seattle have to build a, build an offense around? Well, you got freaking got DK Metcalf, you got Lockett and, um, and Jigba that are there as well. Um, 
but man, yet you build it around around the players that you got. Uh, as far as like unleashing DK, I, I, that's one of to me that is part of the reason why I'm like let's move on from Gino because I don't think that his um, skill set matches what DK does really well. So, but maybe it does, you know. And and now that we have a different um, coordinator, maybe it's better. I so. Why don't we see DK run more crossing routes with that speed? Like freaking yep. right. Um, right. <laughs> so for me, um, last year, Seattle ran the ball 35% of the time. Right. Grubb ran the ball 45% at Washington. I think you're going to see that translate um, over. Now, Keith talked about being adaptable and running to your personnel. I think that's true. And I think we've got a couple of running backs mm -hmm. and an offensive line that's kind of geared towards that. I think they could run the ball more effectively and better. Um, and I think we'll see that. As mm -hmm. it, it, the thing that I'm hung up on right now is the offensive line. We need to kind of figure that out, both uh, you know, in the interior, uh, at center, and then at, at guard, at least left guard. And then tight ends. Like, what are we going to do at the tight end spot? That's going to be in, uh really instrumental uh for grub to be able to be successful uh with what he wants to do is he's going to run a lot of two tight end sets they're going to have some blocking um you're going to see a guy you know leak out and, and all that kind of stuff so tight ends are going to be big i think bigger the usage than we had before and so i'm going to be very curious as to how we handle that in free agency and then as far as DK Metcalf is concerned, it's interesting because if you go look at DK's numbers from 2022, he had 90 receptions for 1,048 yards, averaged 11.6 yards per reception. In 2023, he had 66 receptions, so almost 30 less or 24 less receptions, but had 1,114 yards, averaged 16.9 yards per reception. And I think it's interesting because it, that tells me that that DK can be uh, used in, in many different ways. Um, but I don't see him being used as a primary weapon like you'd think of Cooper Cup, for example, mm. uh, where he's going to get a guaranteed eight receptions a game or 10 receptions for 120 yards and a touchdown. I think we because we've got Njigba and we've got Lockett, and so I still see DK being a decoy occasionally and and having him be the primary deep shot kind of guy um crossers yes i think that we can work those in I'll always get better at stuff like that it's going to be a mist to me it's a mystery yeah. a little bit what grub's going to do because that whole thing that he had at washington is not going to completely translate and he is going to adapt to the personnel that we have and gino so i don't know what do you guys think for me it's kind of interesting because I, I like i look at ryan grub's offense coming across and if you look at what he had at Washington, he had Dylan Johnson, who was a fairly serviceable running back. We have he has an upgrade theoretically running back with K9, who is a home run hitting kind of back. Charbonnet matches up comp wise very close to Dylan Johnson and what they did well together, which is gap run, gap run schemes, which is what Washington ran a lot of last year with Dylan Johnson. But then you look at the receiving core and you go, like you said, Tyler Lockett, JSN, DK. When I look across the board, and yeah, the physical measurables are a little bit different, but you got McMillan, Polk, Adunze. Mm -hmm. So I feel like Grubb can use a lot of what he did at Washington and bring it across because players match up to certain things. Like, it won't be the same. He's going to do different things because guys are different. DK's a world-class athlete. I think at tight end, there's a chance no offense back because I think he adds something to that receiving game like Culp did for – um uh grub last year but that was the one thing that i did catch on is if you look at you know eastern michigan and you look at a lot of these different places that grub's been grub's teams in eastern michigan used to have 2000 yard rushing seasons by their running backs like they were a run heavy team then he goes to washington and matches personnel to be a pass happy and like you said 45 percent run everyone assumes with washington last year they were pass happy i went to a bunch of games and they threw the ball all over the field but you look at those Oregon games when they were in tough, they ran the ball extremely well. The biggest thing for me with Grubb that I'm so happy about is time of possession. Our Seahawks offenses have not been able to stay on the field, and I think it's killed our defense in a lot of ways. But the amount of time of possession he has been able to accumulate with his offenses is what got me so excited because I go, 
whether it's Gino or say Michael Penix or whoever ends up being the quarterback for Seattle, the way Grubb designs his offense is it's going to chew up yards and it's going to stay on the field and we're going to control the tempo and the flow of the game. And to me, that's a huge thing going forward because we're going to be instituting a new defense. We're going to be going through growing pains with that to have an offense that we can go, Hey, we need you to get 30 minutes of time of possession if you can, or 25 rather than games were like last year, we were like, Oh, we were lucky if we had 19 minutes of possession for the entire game, which drove me freaking bonkers. Cause I'm an offensive guy. I'm going, you've got to stay on the field. Um, no, I think it'll be really interesting. But speaking of free agency, how do you think free agency goes now with Pete out of the picture? Do you still think it's bargain shopping or do you think John's a little bit more aggressive? Like, you know, I know they did Draymond Jones last year and that kind of hasn't worked out yet. But do you see them making like clearing up more cap space to go aggressively and maybe address offensive line in free agency and bring in some guards from that spot? Because I agree. I think the guard play definitely needs to improve in Seattle and I'm not sold on Bradford because I just think he's going to get eat his way out kind of what was the lineman they had on their Super Bowl team that did the same thing Bailey that's who I'm thinking of when they had Bailey there and he basically ate himself out of the the, the NFL so um yeah um as far as free agents I I wouldn't be surprised to see them do what they did last year and that is go get one guy and then bargain shop and it, and it could be our own guy Right. Yeah. Um, but if you're going to go out and you're going to get one guy and bargain shop, um, Patrick Queen, little linebacker um, from Baltimore, makes so much sense for him to come in and already know the system, already know what they're doing, help him get guys in place, um, you know, kind of be that voice in the um, in the meeting room of, of the guy that's that's not asking questions because um, he doesn't know. He's the guy that's answering questions because he's been there. Um, that would be that would be really nice. But Bill's point, I mean, um, you know, Jordan Brooks is as athletically uh, the same guy, and he was so important to Seattle's run defense. You saw what happened when he got hurt, and then all of a sudden they couldn't they couldn't stop the run at all. Yeah. Um, you know, it might be that our own guy, but given the choice between the two of them, just because of his familiarity with the new defense. I, I man, Patrick Queen would make so much sense. I think for me, it depends on how much money they are willing to generate. Um, they they start now a little bit better shape this week than they were last week um, with Geno's deal and then the, the league coming out and uh, providing a little bit more money. Um, so they're sitting at about 12. Uh, Keith and I have done a few different shows on cap already, and we've pretty much generated about 40 million dollars not touching gino's contract so i think they can generate about you know have about 50 million at this point um to be able to to work with and it depends on how they structure contracts you know they can they can light load these things in 2024 and and push things out a little bit so they could do pretty much whatever they want to do um with the obvious limitations but i think they can get you know, three or four starters out of this uh, free agency period, and they're going to need to. There's a lot of uh, free agents, uh, unrestricted guys uh, on the roster. They're going to have to re-sign them or replace them. And, you know, Schneider's always been a guy that wants to solve the roster before he gets to um, to the draft. And so I think they're going to at least have rotation depth at every position, and they may be light a couple different starters, or they might uh, have a couple question marks. Um, that they can solve in the draft. But um, I, I don't see them swing huge. Patrick Queen seems like a, a pretty large expense for a, a interior off-the-ball linebacker with a new defense like this, but I get it. I get the idea that he could come in and know everything and, and really kind of communicate that on the field, uh, and that's going to be critically important. Um, so that one's kind of back and forth for me. Leonard Williams be a guy that I definitely want to resign. Depends on his number, obviously. I think they could work that contract where his cap hit could be in the ten million dollar range first year, and that would be, I think, a real nice get for us to to kind of solidify that thing and then find a guy in the in the draft um, to to pair with him. I'm not sure where Jaron uh, Reed is going to be in this defense. He was out of position last year, I think. You know, he's a, he's a fine three tech. Um, there's a few three techs in this uh, draft that I'd be interested in um, looking at. And we'll just have to wait and see. Um, back end seems to be solved. The offense needs a, 
some interior help on the, on the line. Everything else is okay. I think we'll be okay at tight end eventually. And then the, it's all going to be defense for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Though you guys bring up Patrick queen, cause we've discussed him a lot on this show and, you know, we've talked to different people in the Jordan Brooks argument. Obviously he's, he's obviously projected to be a lot cheaper. Right. But, you know, like you said, you bring in Patrick queen, He's with he's been with Mike McDonald that that defense he come in sort of if you want to call him the alpha dog and he can come in but again how much do you want to pay for that how much do you you know say hey the importance of this position and you know we've seen what we 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 did with the safety room right as far as pay over maybe well Jamal Adams we, but we overpaid we overpaid but you know definitely overpaid so. You know that that's going to be a tough one. We we both left Queen. We agree, man. Like Leonard Williams is is kind of the number one guy you got to mm-hmm. look at as far as you know re-signing him. But you know, just kind of looking ahead here, um, the secondary. Do you, do you think it's kind of set, or you know, I, I just brought up Jamal, right? So who who do you think? Uh, obviously, our corner room is is really deep. Um, do you think kind of we're set in, in, in those positions or you see some changes? Do you see Bryce and I even talked about a guy like Wolin, like will he fit his system? Obviously he had a down year last year, but he's got a lot of upside. Do you see any changes there? Well, I see changes like both safeties. You're yeah. um, Diggs is, is a name and he's a guy that's been around Seattle. And I think people are gonna be like, Oh, you can't get rid of him. He was so important, but go look at his play last year. His play was way down. Um, he was stealing money from the Seahawks. And um, you can replace him and Jamal Adams' production on the field with some pretty just replacement level guys. Um, and they're making, you know, 18 plus million a year each. Um, so I think you're going to see, you know, Julian Love in there and um, insert random player. And you're going to get the similar level of production uh, at a, a fraction of the cost. I think that's where bulk, the bulk of their uh, money is going to come from as far as free agent money. Um, I don't see them moving on from Wollen. I don't see them moving on from, um, you know, really any of the corners. Uh, maybe Mike Jackson, because he's less um, nimble as far as uh, his scheme um, versatility. Because if you go look at what uh, the Ravens did and their, their, their sets, you know, they would run cover two, cover three, cover six. They would, they, they, they were very multiple in terms of what they ran. Uh, and you got to have guys that are flexible in order to do that. And I, I am a huge Michael Jackson fan um, out there. I love what he does. I love his size. And I love the way that he comes up and plays the run. Yeah. Um, but man, he was, he was constructed to play cover three. Um, yeah, he's a, a liability. Corner. He's a liability at times and yeah. in other schemes. I mean, yeah. 100%. Yeah. He's, he's, he was, he has, he does not have the scheme diversity. So I could see them moving on there, but he's not in the top three of your team, right? You got Woolen, um, uh, right. you got Spoon, and you got Trey. Uh, those are your top three guys. Um, I, man, though, it feels like those three guys are set. Mm. Yeah, no, I I agree because like I look at Trey and his bounce back from his injury to this year was huge. He he when Wolin had issues or Witherspoon moved into nickel, he he was phenomenal on the outside playing outside corner. Even though he is a smaller corner by the Pete Carroll standard of being only five ten or five eleven, I think it was. Um, I agree though. I think you have to move on from both Diggs and and Jamal Jamal hundred percent because of his June first post designated ship him off, get rid of him. Um, Diggs, I, you know, just kind of wrapping back to when we were saying, you know, possible players that we could move in the draft to with picks. I could see Diggs being a guy you could do that with, with a team that's struggling at safety. His cap hit isn't terrible. If you were to move him off to more of a, a different team, like say, I don't know, Houston's looking for a safety and he gets to go back to Texas where he lives and stuff. And you could possibly move him somewhere like that. I want to see him out because I want to see Kobe Bryant play. Because when Kobe Bryant played in the preseason at safety, my biggest thing with him was, is he going to be able to come down and and make hits? I know he can cover, and he proved in preseason he could come down and make hits, and then he kind of got forgotten about when he hurt his toe and Witherspoon went to nickel and all that happened. And and the other one's Jonathan Sutherland and Jarek Reed. Like, both of those guys looked good in the preseason. And like you said, 
if you look at the Super Bowl teams that were just in it, name their safeties. They're not high priority guys. They're not big names. They're not any of that. So reinvest that money into areas like your front seven where you're going to need that support, especially with Mike McDonald, who builds his defense front to back, not like Pete, who built it back to front. I agree, Bryce, in that um, you just mentioned three players. I think you're benefiting the most from a scheme change uh, opportunity here, coaching changes. Um, Kobe Bryant, obviously. I mean, he's a great player coming out of college. He had some limitations, obviously, but he's a physical player. He had four forced fumbles his rookie season, never really got into it last year. And then Jarek Reed had the injury, uh, went out for the for the year. Be anxious to see him in in uh, work into this scheme. And then Jonathan Southern was a physical beast um, that could play some real nice in the box safety for you this year. And they like physical football. They like to tackle. They you know so this is going to be really important. Uh, it, it's a great opportunity for him. If I'm him, I'm looking at my chops right now. Like going, there is no safeties on this team after they get rid of these top two guys. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to get my, I'm going to get my chance. And the other guy that can benefit, I think the most is Wolin. Wolin just was odd last year. Just mm-hmm. had, you know, came up in with the injury and training camp and then never really completely recovered. I think he, he lost his confidence. Something that was going on there. I, you know, for whatever reason, the coaching, on the defense this last year was just not up to standards. And I think he suffered the most out of any player on our team. And so I'm really anxious for him to be able to kind of come in gain that confidence back and, and um, anxious to see what he can do. Yeah. that that, that, Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Keith. I was going to say you're, you're talking about Sutherland and I'm like, um, I took a beating um, a year ago saying that it was time to move on from Jamal Adams. He did the, the just um, wait, give him the June 1st designation. But as soon as he passes a, a, a physical, he's gone. Um, they, they would have gotten very little in cap space, a ton of dead money, but they'd be going into this next year with a, a, a bigger cap number and only one season away from uh, having his contract off the books. And I think that if they'd done that and committed to Sutherland, their defense would have been better overall, mm-hmm. but they kept trying to bring Adams back and hope that he was the guy, the same guy he was like three years ago. Um, and it never worked. And all they did was push the problem of that contract back another year. So now it's going to um, be affecting this team, you know, for another year. So he's got to get off the roster this year. So that way it's not killing him in 2026 as well. Yeah, no, I agree. I think I think there's no way you roll Jamal back. I just, I mean, just with, even with just the play alone. I mean, we talk about the injury history, and I, I think, like you said, I agree. They just kept trying and trying. Everyone loved the energy. You know, people talk about the energy as a leader, and then you, you sort of realize, like maybe, maybe that's not even true either. You know, just obviously some of the off-field stuff that was happening, the stupid little things that you know, you know, we, that that everybody knows about. And then it was just, you know, then the play on the field. It just you know, the guy was just horrible in coverage and it just, and it's a tough injury to come back from, right? That's the thing that we, that we got to realize. And, and he just, he looks slower. It just, and, and he probably wasn't a hundred percent obviously. Right. But it's just, you, you got to move on and, and you, you go with the young guys you, you feel like, Hey, we, we got a couple of guys and Julian love look good late in the year. So, you know, I, I don't think there's any, any issues there at all. Um, and then really, really quick, I got a question to, to go back on the offense there about, Guys, you know, you mentioned the three receivers we got with, with Lockett being, you know, almost that third guy now. It's felt like JSN took that role as that second guy, and uh, him and him and DK are that one, two. And it's tough a lot of times to have three productive receivers on a team. And he's getting older. Do, do you guys think there's a chance that he might retire before the season even gets going here? Retire? I don't think so. Um, I think he's still got he's still got football left in him. Um, I think that the Seahawks moving on from him and trading him, um, maybe having to rework his contract a little bit and then trade him, which means they have to eat most of the salary cap hit themselves rather than giving it up to another team, um, might be a possibility. Uh, and so, but I could see them doing that because you look at last year, he started out good, but down the stretch, he was dropping balls. This guy that was one of the more sure-handed receivers um, in the league for most of his career. And he was dropping balls like crazy at the end of the last season. And you're right. JSN was, was taking over the production and, and really kind of in that spot. So I could see them 
them moving on. Um, but his contract is one. I don't think you cut him this year. He's going to be around for one more year if that's the only option. Um, and so I think I think Ryan Grubb's going to have a word with you because he's salivating at having those tools at the top of the roster to work yeah, with. And I think that. that you know if you're going to do anything with Tyler Lockett, I think you rework the contract a little bit. You kind of push some money out. Yeah, he's an older player, but he's also proven that he's going to be dependable and be around. Um, and he might be giving you diminishing returns, but I don't see him moving on. I think his contract is, is such that he's untradeable, um, at, at that number. And so I, I let him either play out and eventually work yourself out of that contract, or you kind of rework that a little bit, maybe move some bonus money around, give yourself five, $6 million this year to spend and, and keep him because after and Jigba, you've got Bobo, Young, Eskridge. Eskridge, I'm kind of looking to see if maybe he could figure out a way to get out in the field this year with a new uh, scheme and, and, a, and a new coaching staff. Um, that could be his only hope uh, is is to kind of stay healthy and, and work himself into a role, maybe a, a kick returner or something like that. But um, Derek Young is the kind of player I think they, they could get some snaps, a nice physical uh, player that you can move around a little bit around the line of scrimmage. And then Jake Bobo, I think, I mean, talk about a, a really nice piece that really is underutilized. Um, mm -hmm. I think that he could end up being a guy that you could really kind of move the chains with. Um, and, and Anquan Bolden, kind of a, a player yeah. where uh, he could he could uh, be your third down outlet. When I look at Jake Bobo and I saw him last year in training camp, the first person that popped into my head if I went player comp was Joe Jarevicius. That's literally who yeah. he reminded me of was Joe Jarevicius. Like, isn't the fastest guy down the field, but he just, you know, I think back to that 2005 team with Seattle, Joe Jarevich has always got open. He was such a smooth route runner and he'd go in those places that they, like you said, you know, Anquan Bolden type of guy that will go get those tough yards. Both of Bobo's touchdowns weren't exactly the easiest touchdowns in the world to make last year. So um, no, I, I've kind of toyed with the Tyler thing going, does he retire? Do they trade him? Do they keep him around another year? I think, the more I've gone back and forth, I think you kind of keep Tyler now and let his contract play out. And then he probably will retire. Cause I think he's only got two years left on his deal this year and next year. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably what he'll do is he'll retire. Cause he has started that real estate business in Seattle, which is doing quite well for himself. And I think it was KJ said on his show this year that Tyler Lockett will retire a Seahawk. He's just a Seahawk player. That's what he is. I don't know if Tyler would be willing to up and move and get traded somewhere and sign off on that. So it could be interesting. I just, I'm not, I think Tyler's here. I think you're going to see D Eskridge is I still, I will never, like I have such a hard time with him because uh, there's so much potential, but every time I look at him and he's injured or on IR and then I look to, you know, Kansas city and I go, and there's Creed Humphrey who we could have had locking down our own line. Sorry, Keith, I had to bring that up because that's the crux of D. Eskridge for me. And he'll always that be is so team. painful. It he, is so he was painful. there. He he dropped. He was sitting there, and you're yep. like, Yes, they're gonna go finally get their center. And they take this little tiny gadget player <laughs> that Michigan of all places. And yeah. you're like, what the hell are they doing? And then the Rams get Humphrey and he freaking yeah. plays as an all pro as a rookie. And yeah. you're just like, God damn it. It's like yeah. uh thing to do. <laughs> um but yeah, no, I just, one thing I wanted to kind of ask you guys, what are your impressions of just John Schneider this whole off season from obviously the press conference with Pete, you know, moving on and, and that to his media tour right now at the combine, like, do you think we see a different John Schneider and Seahawk franchise going forward now without Pete around? Or do you still think it stays somewhat how it's been and they just insert Mike McDonald and go forward that way? I think in, in two different respects, I think it stays the same. Uh, John Schneider's John Schneider. I think everything that, that he's, you know, said for the last 14 years, he's meant it's been him. It, he's, he's been married to, to Pete Carroll, but he's also his own guy. And, and everything he said is, it says is somewhat calculated. Um, he's kind of runs the, the ship like a businessman every time he speaks it's, but it's, it's insightful right? He, he talks about the team's process. He's pretty open about that, what he values, the character, the work ethic, the grit, the love of the game, you know, how do players learn? Are they smart? Are they instinctual? All that stuff stays the same. And we take, and, and two, 
when you take a look at the, the coaching and the philosophy of Mike McDonald, and you really take a look at what Pete Carroll really liked and wanted to have in his teams, uh, he always talked about the, the pillars of success, you know, special teams, defense, offense, blah, 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 blah. I think you could pin Mike McDonald down in a room and they would sound awfully, the, uh, awfully alike, you know, as far as how they want to win games, what's really important to them, what kind of players they value, um, the, the physical nature of, of the, uh, the team, both on offense and on defense, um, not just the defense. He wants his offense to be physical as well. He wants to run the ball effectively. You know, all these things you, you hear from Mike McDonald, you, you've been hearing for 10, 15 years from Pete Carroll as well. So for me, I think John's kind of created a younger version of Pete Carroll in a way, maybe not as dynamic and, and flamboyant, and robust as far as a practice guy is concerned. But philosophically, I think these guys are pretty close. The, I, I, I see, I see significant difference. Yeah. They want to win with physicality. It's football. Right. Um, but you look at the Ravens defense and they won, not just by being, you know, tough, they won with speed and you and I have been, uh, talking about the need for this defense to get faster for or five years and they haven't, they've gotten slower in order to get bigger and tougher. Um, and I see that changing. Um, and it's it's things like that that I that I see I see um, a, a difference, maybe not in in terms of you know underlying philosophy, but in the way that it's implemented. Um, you know, rather you're not going to get those 260 pound linebackers. You're going to get 235 pound guys that can really run. Um, and and I, I think you're going to see a lot more of that kind of stuff um, in this in this version of the defense. And, and so I do kind of see a little bit of a change um, in terms of, uh, of the players and, and that kind of stuff. But overall, do you start, do you see John Snyder start taking um, risks on low character guys again, like he did with uh, Malik McDowell? No, I don't. Um, he's going to still be going after the high character guys. Um, so there are, there are some, some like pillars of his philosophy that aren't going to change, but I do think the, physical traits of uh the guys that he's going to go out and get are going to tweak some you're going to see faster guys um with this defense you're going to see more versatile guys especially on the back end um you know pete carroll brought in a new a new scheme in theory but then they ran still ran cover three on every freaking play um mm -hmm. uh this last year and i see mcdonald is not but he does not think that playing cover three on every play is the, is the right. Um, so he's going to, he's going to have his guys be multiple. So you're going to need guys that can be multiple. Um, but I still think they need a, a anchor in the center of that defense on the, on the defensive line. They've, they've not had a true oh, yeah. zero nose. Tack, nose tackle uh, on this team. And that's been the missing piece. I mean, that's really what makes a three, four, a three, four, yeah. and, and it works because you've got a guy that's taken on double teams, two gapping and so forth. They've not been able to do that. They, they, they they've been a, misplaying guys for yeah. three seasons now straight. That's well, they, they, they haven't had a true nose since Brandon Niebane. Yeah. And, and I mean, Puna oh, Ford go. was a guy, but, uh, and I love Puna, Puna Ford, but he was, you know, undersized in that role. He was good in that role, but he was undersized in that role. Yeah, and you mentioned you know misplaying guys. Bob Bobby was an actual example last year about a sort of a guy supposed to be brought in as a leader, but well, I wouldn't say part time, but not nearly as many snaps as he is he got. And then you saw what happened, right? And we blame him for you know not being able to cover downfield on on third down plays and all this kind of stuff. So you know, hopefully we we see that change, like you said. Just you know, you're bringing in guys for for this reason. We we thought sort of when the the John and Pete era, you know, and, and they they sort of, you know, probably had some disagreements a lot, you know, when John would bring guys in and and then you know, used incorrectly, like going back to even a Jimmy Graham, right? Like you bring him in not to be this blocking tight end because that's not what he does, right? And then and then so just just things like that. Um so so going back to Bobby real quick and talking about the linebackers, do you do you see him back maybe in a one year deal and 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 maybe where he was supposed to maybe a first down, second down guy, um, just being that leader and, and still being able to, to, you know, attack and, and kind of stop the run there. Um, do, do you see him bringing, bringing him back on a, on a one year? 
Um, uh, John will like yeah. him and want him in. Um, whether or not McDonald wants him is a mm-hmm. different story. Um, I think it depends on, you know, the whole Patrick Queen situation. If he's got his quarterback of his defense um, there at the middle linebacker spot, I think Bobby's done. Yeah. Um, if they if it doesn't work out, they don't end up getting him. And um, you can do far worse than than bringing in a first ballot Hall of Famer um, to kind of be that leader. But I, yeah, he should not have been playing 90 percent of the snaps last year. Yeah, there's no way. Like, I would bring Kelly in Bobby to play 60 so. percent of the snaps at five million dollars. I mean, right. if, if that yeah, to me that would be, be a no brainer. Yeah, that would be perfect. Yeah. Yeah, no, I I I, th- I agree with you guys completely, and and I agree too. It's it's going to come down to the Queen thing because you know if you you spend all that money on Queen, then it's like like you said, you got your quarterback there, and and then uh, you're good. So yeah, I I completely agree. Um, just a couple more things for you guys. Um, talking about the Senior Bowl, obviously is come and gone. Uh, and then we're in, in the middle of the combine. Anybody in the combine sort of really impress you that that you could sort of see hey this this guy could be a, a seattle seahawk uh early on here that maybe that you see, you know maybe moved up a little bit just based on his combine i've got a few players and stop me if if i just <laughs> rattle them off uh too much but brandon fisk i mean no oh, yeah what not to like about the brandon fisk performance yeah. not only at the at the combine but at the senior bowl so he kind of carried that over and you know a guy had 28 pressures six sacks in 2023 not long arms, got 32 inch arms. That's going to be an issue, but he's got so much speed and agility. Uh, 6'4, 292 pounds, around a 478 40 uh, with a 168 split. That's fantastic. A 438 short shuttle. What? I mean, that's amazing, yeah. right? Jared Verse looked good. Dallas Turner, those guys, if they're looking for an edge type guy, um, those, those guys would kind of be in play. Jimmy uh, Newton um, is going to be on their radar. I think they had a private meeting with him. Chop Robinson looked good. Uh, Mike Wingo uh, from LSU had a really nice, consistent workout, looked good overall. Keith and I fell in love with Jackson Powers Johnson, the interior offensive lineman uh, oh, to play yeah. center. I mean, if that guy oh, could be on the roster, I would take him at 16. I would move, if, I, if I could move down a little bit, you know, into the 20 range and he's still sitting there to me, that would be a no brainer or Graham Barton, I think maybe even offers a little bit more scheme versatility overall. Now, both those guys could play inside or uh, at center or guard. Um, so I think those are going to be something that they would uh, be interested in. I know that Keith and I have talked about scheme wise, as far as safeties are concerned, if we're jettisoning our safeties, maybe we look at the draft to, to get a young guy to come in. And I know that Mike McDonald values safeties. Mm-hmm. Um, Geno Stone is a good example of what they were able to do there at, with the Ravens. A guy like Cameron Kitchens, um, NFL scouts really like his game. He ran a four six forty. Didn't look great today at the at the combine as far as straight line speed, but he's very instinctual and smart. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's just a bunch of guys. Really, I mean, depth wise, I think this draft is really good through rounds four for sure. Um, you get to five, six, seven, uh, and eight, it gets a little sketchy, um, as far as depth and rotation players, guys uh, that you're drafting in the seventh round may not even make your roster this year. Um, so that's kind of the weakness of of the draft, but the draft is really strong at offensive tackle, uh, interior offensive line. If you need one of those guys in this draft, you're going to be able to get one wide receivers strong. Again, corners are are pretty decent. Safeties are, eh, uh, you know, um, and defensive line is pretty strong. So, I mean, there's there's a lot to like. And there, I think Seattle is going to do well in the positions that they need out of this draft. Yeah. Go ahead, Bryce. Well, no, I was just going to say one of the safety kind of guys, like you were just saying, Bill, about safeties being possibly an, an area of possible, you know, use some capital there. Uh, I think it's Malik Mustafa from Wake Forest. Oh, is yeah. I'm, I'm very Absolutely. interested we both like him. Um, just because he's quite versatile as, as what he's shown on film, he doesn't just play in the box. Well, he can play in space well. And I think he'd be a really good compliment to a Julian love or, you know, Sutherland. If those two ended up, if, if we had Mustafa and Sutherland as our two safeties or, you know, Mustafa love and Sutherland as our three safeties next year, I'd be okay with that. I think that's a good allocation of some resources. Um, I really like, Fisk and what he did in his 40 and, and what he showed. 
Christian Hayes is someone or Haynes is someone that I'm interested in as a guard. You know, I know we've had our luck with Philip Haynes not being so great, but I really don't want to see Seattle spend a lot of money in bringing back Damian Lewis. Like he hasn't really, to me, since his rookie year, really been gotten any better. Um, so I'd like to see them spend some money there. I'm kind of centers a position I've looked at a little bit, just being like, do we need to add someone? I'd be okay. I want to see what they got in Olu. That's who I want to see. Like, you know, Evan Brown played a majority of the snaps last year and Evan Brown was okay. He wasn't, you know, gangbusters or anything, but I think Olu, you know, if you watch his Michigan tape and what he did there, I think he'd be interesting to see, let him come in and actually compete for the starting job. Um, The other thing for me is like you said, after round four with the NIL now in college football rounds, five to seven are just kind of a deserted Sahara desert. Like there's, there's nothing there because none of the guys you're going to get would come out because they can stay in college and make the same kind of money they'd make as a fifth or seventh round player. So it'll be interesting to see how much movement there is for John to get more picks in the top four rounds than there is in the bottom five. Like he usually has. Or, or move out of this yeah. uh, draft and push it out to 2025. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey guys, one, one final question. Um, where do you, where do you see, for yourself, if you had to say a successful season next year for Seattle would be what? Oh man. Um uh how about the sixth seed in the playoffs? Wow. I, I they're not they're not competing with San Francisco, but if they can they can reestablish you know themselves as a playoff team make those improvements, uh, get younger, get faster, and just get themselves in year one under this new scheme uh, ready to make that leap in year two. Um, and uh, to me, I, I'd be okay with that. I, I'm I'm not looking for them to, to win a Super Bowl the first year with this coaching staff. I think um, I'd add uh, everything that uh, Keith said for sure. And then I'd add uh, have a quarterback on the roster that's ready to go in 2025. I, I just think that it'd be oh, nice yeah. to have a player that um, this is this is going to be one of those transition years, obviously. And I think you got to give a little bit of grace, a little bit of leeway to McDonald to kind of build this thing, build it into his uh, image. It takes up takes, you know, you're only going to turn what thirty five percent of your roster in in a single year. And if you hit on everything, that would be great. I think we could get to the fifth, sixth seed if if we're just kind of not improving um, and struggling in a couple of spots, um, then I think that we may miss the playoffs again. But if we've got a quarterback of the future on the roster, I'd feel a lot better about 2025. Yeah. And I think that's what this year is all about is the next two years after that. Yeah, I, I agree. Cause like I look at the 2025 QB class and it is worse than this year's QB class for, for talent. So I, I'd like to see the same thing, Bill. I want to see a QB on the roster that's ready to take over and move, whether that's a Michael Penix or Spencer Rattler, one of the top three guys, because they move up and get J.J. McCarthy or somebody like that. Um, I For me, this year, I want it to kind of be reminiscent of 2011, when we went from Hasselbeck to T-Jack to then Russell, where the Legion of Boom started to come together, the defense started to play well. Like I want to see them start to be a team that, you know, other teams go, shit, we got to go to Seattle and play that defense. And and not they're going to be the LOB again, because that's never going to happen. You're never going to get that collection of generational talent together again. But not where you're kind of the punching bag for San Francisco or the Rams. Like, I want to see it where, you know what, we we punch back when we play San Francisco. We're not getting the breaks beat off us 31 to, to 10 or whatever. Like, how they used to be where they were tight games, and it was like 20 to 14. And for God's sakes, don't lose to the freaking Rams anymore. Like actually compete with the Rams and split games with the Rams where you're splitting games in your division and you're actually competing again. Like that's what I want to see that energy and that life kind of come back. That's what I'm looking for. And then 2025, 2026, then we can talk about how deep can we go in the playoffs? How far can we really start to push this thing? If they go, I've said, you know, another nine and eight season, if they make the playoffs great, if they don't, but there's progress and you can see that developing, that's successful for me. If they have like four wins, I'm going to be horrified at what's going on. Yeah. I don't necessarily, 
I agree with almost everything you just said, except for the last statement. If they had four wins, <clears throat> as long as they look like Dan Campbell's Rams from two years ago, and yeah. you could see the obvious improvement at the yeah. end of the year, and then they went into 2025 and they started winning games and they got real competitive and maybe they squeak in, but but the trajectory is up. That's right. the whole key is I want to see the trajectory go from diminishing returns to ascending because it, it's been diminishing now, even though we've kind of maintained the, the record, the team, you can just see that the, the defense is, is very poor. Um, that Clint hurt was over his head a little bit as defensive coordinator that Pete Carroll for all his uh, positives was, was not keeping up with, with uh, competition uh, in his own division. And so I want to see, like you said, Bryce, the competitive nature of the team completely turn on a dime and really get competitive, beat teams up, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. If you're looking at 2025 and saying you're, you know, four wins, as long as you're, you're, you're competitive, why the hell are you paying Geno Smith $25 million this next right. year? Well, yeah. you know what I mean? I mean, we're going to, we're going to win. I think you can pencil in eight, nine wins with Geno Smith, right? But you know, you know what I mean? I, I know I what like, you're saying, but I'm just saying if you're if you're looking at 2025 and beyond, and you're saying you know next year is all about just you know improvement and 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 establishing that defense and all that, then then you're just, you're making the case to remove on from Geno Smith and go ahead, you know, and be bad for your let let Drew Lock play right. and 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 be four and eleven and be in position to draft a, um, you know, quarterback in the very top of the uh, of the the draft the following year. Um, and I just like, to me, I look at that, at, at the argument that you're making as far as what you expect for next year is the argument to not have Gino on the roster. I mean, yeah. well, I'm not trying to make an argument that we should have four wins. I'm just saying yeah. I would accept four wins <laughs> if, if there, there was a wholesale turnaround and, and the team just got more competitive we may have lost close games, et cetera, or maybe, uh, Gino started the year, uh, as the starter, but was replaced, you know? and we just lost games with a rookie or whatever, um, I'm willing to accept a certain amount of losses in order to get better eventually. Yeah, I, I like I like what you said about the, you know, get a quarterback, have him sit, you know, get ready for 2025. And just for me, I look at it like wins will take care of themselves. I'm not I'm not too worried about 2024. Obviously, yeah, you you know, if they if they win 13 games and we go on this crazy run, sure, but Though, how are the players going to respond to Mike? How are we looking in November, December compared to the start of the year? We we've seen kind of how this team was nine and eight, and sort of the 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 way the year was ending is like that's the wrong trend, right? You want to see like I even mentioned what they got going down in Arizona, not the talent we got, but the the way those guys are they got a new culture down there with Gann, and and it seems like they're they got they got Tyler, they got Kyler figured out. Yeah, they play till the end, and that's yeah. sort of for me. You know, just sort of that's sort of the the success I look at. Like, how are these guys going to respond to Mike and, and this coaching staff and just the the play on the field? Like, you we brought up guys, you know, this last hour, like Wolin and what can you get on Draymond Jones? Like, there's guys on this team that you want to see. You know, what can Mike get out of these guys? Like you mentioned, Wolin. Like, I don't know what's happening with them. What will Clint's over his head? And you know, so so to me, it's like, what can you get out of these guys? Um, put them in the best position to succeed and then roll that into 2025. Um, you know, whether Gino's there or not, like you said, I agree. If it's four wins, okay, well, you know, how 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 is that trajectory going, right? So for me, I, I'm not even putting a win total or not even worried about that. And and then to me, it's like how, you know, watch the games as a fan, you know, like if anyone's worried about statistics, just watch the game, evaluate, and, and you'll figure it out pretty quick, like how this – the 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 trajectory this team's going to go so that that's overall how I look at it too. One just quick little caveat here. I'm just looking because Corbin Smith just posted the official visits that have gone gone on, and I'm just looking at the quarterback list. And so I know there's some other quarterbacks they've spoken with, but yeah. JJ McCarthy, Jaden Daniels, Drake May, uh, Bo Nix, Matt. Uh, I think it's Matt Prate. It's kind of interesting that those are the guys that they're like they haven't talked to Penix because they've asked Penix at the combine if he's talking. I don't think Seattle's going to talk to Penix because they have they all the info. Yeah, they don't need to talk to Penix because no. of Grub, but they also don't need to talk to Penix because he's local, and so he can come in and Anytime not count again. 
yeah, not count as one of their interviews right. and not, not count as a workout or any of that. They can just bring him in. So, yeah, I just find it interesting, like Jaden Daniels, Drake May, those guys, like, you know, it just leads me to think kind of what Bill said earlier in the show, that if somebody slips in there and ends up in that 10 to 13 kind of range, that maybe Seattle does move up and just go get a guy. I yeah, those are just in case interviews. I mean, really, they they're just in case. And P- yeah. and uh, John even said that on a local local radio. He yeah. just said, "Listen, we we're doing our due diligence. We're going to go out. We're going to talk to these guys. We want to get to know them. Um, they also want to, you know, do some scouting, just uh, to have uh, against other teams eventually, and and potentially guys that could move around a little bit in free agency sometime down the down the line." So. so my last question for you both is if you had to put a percentage on a quarterback in this class that ends up in Seattle, who would you put the most money on or percentage? I should say. Wow. I heard some things about Jaden Daniels today. Um, potentially slipping a little bit and getting into the 10 range and, and Seattle working on a, on a deal to move up. Um, I will say though that the, Bo Nix looks intriguing to me because I think he's going to be available when Seattle has a pick. And um, it seems like he's a, a very accurate passer that can make all the throws when necessary. He might not have the biggest arm in the, in the, in the world, but uh, he's shown growth over many years um, and improved and, you know, got, a, got his team into the, into the championship series and, He's a, he's a good quarterback. I watched him play in person this year at uh, Arizona State uh, in in Phoenix, and he he was the best player on the field, no doubt about it. And so I, I wouldn't be opposed to that. But. I'd say McCarthy um, because I, I think that he's the fourth quarterback in this class and is the one most likely to be available in the 10 range, 11 range. And I think they got to move up in front of 12 in order to draft their guy because um yeah just look at look at the draft order and there's going to be um there, teams, there's yeah. some guys that there's some quarterback needy teams right before seattle so if they want one they're going to have to move up um to you know 10 or 11 and uh he's the most likely guy to be available in that range uh, i'm i got a feeling and it's just i got a feeling somehow michael Penix is going to end up in a seahawk uniform because of Grub, I love McCarthy and I'd love him, but I got a feeling Denver, he seems like a Sean Payton type of guy. And I could see them scooping him up right when Seattle tries to move in. And I think then if I think if McCarthy goes or Daniel goes just before Seattle, they'll move back. And I think Michael Penix, when you move back because of the familiarity, probably leads him a little bit over some of these guys like Rattler and and Milton and that to go get him. Ryan, who do you think it'll be? Man, I don't know. If if Jane if if he does slip, Jane Daniels, um, I mean, you got to take a hard look. But again, um, it's 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 tough to call, man. It's just tough to call. I mean, I I like I like everyone that that you guys are throwing out there. So it's uh, it's gonna be. I mean, I know they're gonna. I I just they're gonna take one. So that's that's where I'm going. I'm not even gonna throw a guy. I I wouldn't be mad at Penix. I like JJ McCarthy. Um, so you know, and then Bo Nix and. Would would be nice too. So you know we'll we'll see here uh, coming up pretty pretty quick because we know the draft is uh, going to come here in no time. So guys, uh, we really appreciate you coming on, hanging out uh, this long with us and talking hawks. And uh, where uh, what do you guys got going on? Where can people find your stuff? Well, we are uh, at Seahawks Playbook Podcast on our, our website. Um, you can find us on your favorite podcast platforms, everything from Spotify to Amazon Music to, you know, any anything, really. And then we've got our own YouTube channel, Seahawks Playbook Podcast. Um, we appreciate the, the subscriptions and the likes and all that good stuff. And uh, we've been around for a while. This is our uh, eighth season now. We're about 545 shows in. And uh, we don't plan on, on stopping anytime soon. So come see us. Right on now. Yeah, we appreciate it, guys. Go go check them out. Seahawks Playbook uh, Podcast. And, uh, yeah, um, awesome content. Guys, we appreciate it again coming on. And, uh, you know, we'd love to have you guys on again and, and uh, talk Seahawks. Yeah, thank you very much. Awesome. And we'll have you guys on too. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Hey, guys, that was 
Keith Myers and Bill Alstead from the Seahawks Playbook Podcast. Awesome having them on, man. That was that was a, a, a wicked conversation. Just just opinions, talking a lot of quarterback stuff, the, G, the Gino stuff kind of swirling. You know, they both sort of had, you know, different opinions on, uh, you know, Keith. Man, eh, he kind of seemed like he he could do with him off the roster where, you know, Bill's more in our in our sort of court with like, you know, we're not banging on the table, but, uh, you know, we, we run it back, especially I think we're all in agreement with having a young guy in this draft to, to, to be ready to go for 2025. Well, yeah, totally. And, and I think that's something like I'm looking just at what potentially is there in 2025 for quarterbacks in that draft class you're not getting the same quality. Like you're hoping more about guys, you know, hitting their seat, you know, hitting their stride. And, you know, really it's Sanders and Ewers right now. And they're kind of the two top dogs in that class right now, as it looks like if I'm Seattle, like you got to take somebody this year, you, you have to do it because, and that doesn't mean like, and I know how Keith said, or you take someone in the sixth or seventh round, like, for me, I've got – these are the quarterbacks I see that Seattle needs to take a chance at. J.J. McCarthy, if he falls, and he's yep. there. Yeah. J.J. McCarthy. If not, I'm looking at Penix, Bonix, Rattler, and Pratt, or Pratt. Right. Those are the next four I have circled. Yeah. I'm taking one of those guys. And, like, Pratt and Penix have both stated in interviews that they have talked to – or Penix hasn't talked to Seattle, but Pratt has – that they'd love to learn behind Gino for a year. Cool. Yeah. I already got two guys that want to learn behind him. Then mm. those are guys that are going to be, I think, in the second and third round that you can take. Yeah. And let them groom for a year. Like, and this is the thing I think we 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 sometimes get so wrapped up in is as fans, as analysts, as whatever, is we look at these guys that are going to be in the top, the very right. top. And you look at like right. Brock Purdy was Mr. Irrelevant. He took a team to a Super Bowl with the correct roster around him. Sure. But you look at some of these other guys, like you can find quarterbacks that can play and win Super Bowls. Russell Wilson, if he had been six foot two, would have been a higher pick. But sure. Russell Wilson was a third round pick. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just. Uh, they're all prospects at the end of the day. They're all prospects. It's, Brady. it's not I mean, a perfect you know, science. Not it's, that you're finding everybody in the fifth round and all that. And that's no. your strategy. But you, we should pull up you know, the last 10 or 15 years of quarterbacks have been drafted in the top 10. You know, there's a lot of guys that didn't work out. So, you know, and and it's it's yet to be seen how these guys, I mean, Caleb Williams isn't a sure shoe in to win you a championship. Neither is Drake May or any of the guys. So, you know, and all of a sudden, why is Jane, Jaden Daniels slipping? You know, it, it's like, it, you know, it, you just, you don't know. So, you know, I think Seattle, you you trust what they can do. I like the fact that you can go into day two and still have a selection of guys that you can choose from that you think this could fit. I honestly think Seattle is going to move back to get our second round pick, regardless right. of the reason they're, they're going to. Because like yeah. Bill said, John's not going to go 60 selections without having a pick. In yeah. It's just not John Schneider's way. Not him, man. Um, they may move down twice. They may go, you know, from 16 to 22 and then from 22 down to Trade again. Yeah. 31. Yeah. 32. And then get another pick or whatever. John um, likes picks, right? He likes the, the cumulative. John likes right? picks. I don't think he's happy what, with what he's sitting at. Right. And because of what Jim Nagy said in fifth round to seventh round, there's not a lot of talent in there. Like no. the NIL is really kind of, John's going to want to try and recoup as much as he can in that top echelon of the draft. Totally. Um, but, you know, I just – I'm. it's funny because, like, I was reading about Penix. Apparently his medicals came back really positive. Right. And now it's considered, like, Schefter's even said, like, NFL executives are pushing it under the radar. It's not a concern anymore. No one's talking about it because he went and did this whole thing. And, and yeah. you know what? Like, yeah. you look at some of these guys. If I'm evaluating a quarterback, I want a guy that's going to compete, that yeah. wants to – Michael Penix is throwing. Yes. Spencer yeah. Rattler's throwing. Joe Milton's throwing. My, Matt Pratt's throwing. Guess who's not throwing? Caleb Williams. Caleb. Well, that's not, a, that's not a surprise. Jaden Daniels. J.J. McCarthy's throwing. Mm. But the thing with Williams, and, and, and I may get a lot of heat I, I'm not a Caleb guy. I'm not no, a Caleb guy. I'm not either. And, no. you know, a buddy of mine was telling me that, you know, he had heard an interview with Mike Florio and Chris Sims where he was talking over his fingers, you know, what his finger placement is, and he's locked in that way. And 
has a QB mind that way and stuff like that. But then I'm watching his interview with the, the media and the combine and they say, how come you're not throwing? Like, don't you want to go out there and compete? Oh, well, you can look at my 30 films, uh, games of me on and, and make judgment off of that. No, I want you to compete now. Yeah, like, yeah. That's fine what you did in your offense that you've understood for you. It's fine with you. That's college what ball, man. It doesn't go your way. Yeah. And you make bad throws out there. How do you respond? And and that's what I don't think a lot of people sometimes understand with what these evaluators are looking for. They get Caleb Williams. We can watch all your film and see what you do with your guys that you're comfortable with, that you've been practicing with. I want to see you go out there and throw to guys that you don't know because when you walk onto my team, you're not going to know DK Metcalf or how fast he runs yeah. or Tyler Lock or that. So what happens when you miss a couple of throws? How do you respond to that when you have a bad day? And that's something John said in his, I want to see who can handle adversity. And that's why I feel like Michael Penix and Spencer Rattler are high up on his list of quarterbacks because of the adversity they both had to deal with throughout their careers in college. Yeah, I agree. I'm just glad they're not they're not in the top two picks, to be honest, because I don't want to worry about if they're going to take Caleb Williams. Because honestly, dude, I'm I'm not a fan. I don't want to see. I don't pray on a guy to fail in the league. But I again, I just I wouldn't want to take that chance in it because he just he is just screaming prima donna already. So it's just like you know, no thank you. I like I like Penix. I like Bo. I like Rattler. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see. Um, yeah. So Caleb's just not a guy. Um, but I agree the 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 point you're making with. You want a guy with a little adversity, a little, little hey, we, I got to compete. I got to, you know, for sure. And we've seen it. We've seen guys like that come in and have success. So, so well, look, I, I'm on board with you. you. You look at some of these guys that are in the top five right now in the NFL and quarterbacks as we rank them. Joe Burrow, Patrick Mahomes, you know, just to name a few, Josh Allen, like Lamar Jackson. So if I name those four off, you know what they all have in common through their college careers? They all went through adversity. Joe Burrow had to transfer from Ohio State to LSU. Patrick Mahomes was at Texas Tech, and they could never win their own division and get to a decent bowl game. It was right. basically him versus everybody. Yep. Um, Josh Allen, no one wanted him. He ended up at Wyoming. Lamar yeah. Jackson gets told he's a running back and yep. drops in the NFL draft. Like yeah, They've all second. gone through something, but now they're all successful. And then you look mm -hmm. at some of these guys that don't do that, Zach Wilson. Zach Wilson's a bust. And like – the other thing for me is when I look at my quarterback, I don't want you in the national media spotlight. You know, Patrick this early? Mahomes is well, yeah, Patrick Mahomes, he's never it's never Patrick Mahomes has done something and gotten the media attention. It's his family members or whatever. Oh, well, sure. But most of these top NFL quarterbacks, you hear nothing about them in the offseason really doing anything. No. Brady and Manning, hush, quiet. They're no. doing their own thing. Yep. Even Russell doing his own thing. Like well, until so recently. Guy, but yeah. yeah. And then you see a guy that's in college putting nail polish on that's no, got the dude, it, uh, f you like i don't even want to talk about on, the man. dude man Bro it's just yeah it, it you know the bears can have them but yep yeah man so it's it's gonna be interesting anyways man yeah awesome having bill on and keith on and and like i said guys go check out go check out their stuff man they, like they said they've been doing it for a long time they're on year eight they they got you know a, a ton of episodes they know they know a lot of football uh, they know they know exactly what they're talking about. So go check them out. Seahawks Playbook Podcast. And uh, yeah, guys, um, for us, that's a great episode tonight. And uh, we got some great guests coming up in this next month. We're going to be talking draft, free agency. Just as it rolls in, we're going to be talking about it. We're going to be bringing it to you guys. So um, yeah, uh, that's it for tonight, man. So uh, we'll catch you guys on the next one here. See ya. Go Hawks. Go Hawks.